So welcome to the welcome to a talk on winter backcountry safety, and thanks to the library for organising this. Um, you know, as a group, we you know our main job is to rescue people, um, but we do try and attend events like this and provide information um, regarding safety in the backcountry and also how to how to um, how to get help if things go wrong. Um, in terms of myself, my name is Simon Piney. I've been with the group for the Search Rescue for about 20 years. I'm responsible for it. Been for uh, 20 years. Um, it feels like an incredibly long time. Uh, the group's about 30 people, and we'll talk a little bit more about that uh, in a moment. So we're quite a small group here tonight. So you know, feel free to um, to interrupt, ask questions. We can go in any direction you guys like. Um, you know, if you want to go into a deep dive on snowpack and crystals and all that, we can do that. But the at least the presentation itself is a little bit higher level than that, we don't go fight such a deep dive on that stuff, but if that's stuff that really interests you, we can talk about that as well. The plan tonight was to talk about just what search and rescue is in British Columbia, um, what training and gear make sense for people uh, recreating in the backcountry, what happens when you call for help, and then a little bit of a talk of some of the rescues that we've done recently, to give you some examples of where stuff does go wrong and how people have got help. And I really feel like the starting point is to say that, you know, the city of Fernie sits in this valley here, and there's an invisible red line around it, it goes into various little weird places. Within that red line, if you get injured or you get hurt, you call 911, and either ambulance or fire will be there, and will be there pretty quickly. And people on staff, they're waiting for that, um, they have easy access within that red line, so there's places where there are roads and easy ways to get in. But beyond that red line, well, it's the wilderness, it's the backcountry. And in many places beyond that red line, you can see the lights of town. But if you're lying there with a broken leg or a broken pelvis, or you're buried in an avalanche, the lights of town might as well be a million miles away. And at that point, search and rescue is the only option. Search and rescue only responds when traditional rescue services cannot. If you break your leg in Rotary Park, then you'll be picked up by ambulance, and that's awesome. They're good at their job, they'll be there quickly. But if you break your leg at the top of um, Mount Fernie, on a snowshoe hike in the winter, then it's going to be us that's going to deal with it. Uh, and there's a very big difference as to how that works, so we'll talk about that. So in terms of search and rescue in BC, um, everyone's a volunteer. So there are 80 groups across the province, and every single person who uh, gives up their time for those groups uh, is unpaid. They're all volunteers. They're volunteers, but uh, they have to maintain professional credentials in their rescue certification. So they do rope rescue or avalanche rescue or swift water rescue, whatever it is, helicopter long line rescue, they have to be professionally certified. So it's one of the biggest challenges we have is you're a volunteer, but you have to maintain professional training and certification and recertification and so on. Um, we don't get paid for our time, but the province pays the groups. So when we get called out on a rescue, the province refunds the group for uh, you know, the equipment used, uh, supplies, stuff like that. Um, and here in Fernie, we're really fortunate to be supported by the city of Fernie. We have a building down by the visitor center, which you guys have probably seen, um, which is um, which is paid for by the city of Fernie. They pay our insurance, they pay the lighting, that sort of stuff, which is pretty awesome. Um, and in BC, there are about 1,800 incidents a year um, responded to by the SAR groups, and 70% of all search and rescue calls in Canada are in British Columbia. It's the nature of our terrain, the nature of the uh, tourist industry, and so on and so forth. Uh, those are the numbers there for the province. So, you know, the overwhelming message is growth, almost exponential growth. Um, why is there exponential growth? Um, a number of reasons. More and more people are accessing the backcountry. Um, more and more people are getting into it by social media stuff. You know, Instagram drives an awful lot of people trying to do stuff, which is a bad idea. Um, it's easier to call for help these days, so sometimes we have calls where, quite frankly, the person could probably have sorted it out on their own, but it's easier to call for help these days, and so on and so forth. It's just a, you know, a pretty natural evolution, uh, and if you look at snow sports and things like that, you know, equipment's becoming easier, it's becoming cheaper, access to more complex places is easier than it used to be, so more people are getting to places where things can go wrong. In 30, we're 30 members or so, varies a little bit, but around 30 members. 
and we're split into technical rescue teams. So we have a swift water team, an ice rescue team, an avalanche team, high angle rope rescue team, class D fixed line, which is helicopter long line, and then CARDA, which is avalanche rescue dogs. <clears throat> the CDFL team, that's CDFL, hanging off a line under a helicopter. Um, <clears throat> we act as the regional center for that. So we cover from the Alberta border to Invermere. So any rescues that require that rescue tool, we, we do that. We don't cover just the Fernie area for that. Activity. So what do we deal with in Fernie? The answer is it's all over the place. A little pie charts there. But what you can see is um, this year, 2022, or that's Last year, we had a lot of water stuff, people getting into trouble on the river. The white there is snowmobilers. They're always a good source of uh, business in inverted commas. Mountain bikers, pretty obvious, you'd expect that around here. And then all sorts of stuff, you know, missing people, hikers and hunters, uh, hikers that are lost, vehicle related stuff. So, you know, if you have an accident here on the highway, fire will respond. But if you have an accident in the flathead uh, in your vehicle, then that will us that will respond. Again, there's that invisible red line beyond it. We deal with whatever's happening out there. Um, in Fernie, the answer is that you know, there is no typical rescue. We have a bit of everything, and it varies from year to year. And we'll talk a bit more about some of the snow-related ones shortly. So, training and gear. Uh, you know, this is meant to be a safety discussion, so you know, how do we stay safe out, uh, stay safe out there? Um, <clears throat> I think there's a few points. This is Ryan. Ryan's the other guy who helps run search and rescue. Um, so, um, you know, there, there are really two points, I think, about traveling in the backcountry. The first is we try and avoid getting into trouble. That's all makes sense. That's awesome. Why would we not do that? But the reality is, if we're out there, stuff can go wrong. And so, you know, our message is not stay safe and don't get into trouble, because that's just not realistic. Our message is really, what are you going to do if it goes wrong? Because if we don't have a plan for that, then things can go horribly wrong. If help isn't coming, in many cases, it will cost someone their life. So we're going to do everything we can to avoid getting into trouble, but we're also going to have a plan just in case it goes to get, we get into trouble. And we call it the three teams, at least at the provincial level. We have a trip plan, we take the stuff that we need into the field, and we train appropriately. And if we do those three things, Hopefully we won't get into trouble, but if we do get into trouble, we'll know what to do about it. We do have a plan B. So let's cover those in turn. So what is a trip plan? I would say quite simply a trip plan is a way to turn something going wrong from a search into a rescue. So there are two scenarios. One is Duncan at the back there goes off skiing for the day. And he doesn't tell his partner where he's going, and by 8 o'clock in the evening she's concerned, so we get a call, and we're told Duncan went skiing for the day, and he, hasn't, he isn't home. So our first question will be, where did he go? And if the answer is, I don't know, well then it's a search. A search is a big problem. We have 4,000 square kilometers to cover. And if we're trying to work out where Duncan went skiing for the day, well, we're into what we call Sherlock Holmes mode. We're going to ask on Facebook, has anyone seen this truck? We're going to ask his friends if they know where he normally goes skiing. We're going to try and ping his cell phone. We're going to look at credit card use and see if we can work out where he went. But this all takes time, and it takes a lot of time. And it can be worse than that. We've had, um, this person is missing. What was their activity for the day? We're not sure. He likes hunting, he likes skiing, and he likes snowmobiling. Well, now we're really into trouble. The snowmobiling and hunting could mean he's not even in our province. In fact, arguably, he could even not be in our country. He could have gone over the border. So the time it takes us to find people is incredibly time consuming. And that's time that's not necessarily on the side of the person who's waiting for help. So a trip plan turns a search into a rescue. Duncan didn't come home from skiing. I know he went skiing on Mount Fernie. Now we're going to go look on Mount Fernie. Now we have somewhere to go look. Even better, he parked at the Canyon Trails trailhead. And his plan was to go up the moccasin, and his plan was to ski laundry chute. Well, wow, now we're really closing it in. That's awesome. That's what a trip plan is. It basically leaves a message with someone who is responsible. and says, this is what I'm doing. This is who I'm doing it with. This is the equipment I'm taking. These are the goals. This, will be, this is when I'll be home. And this is what to do if I'm not home. And that's fantastic. If you look on our website, um, there is a trip plan on there. 
And there are loads of them. You can just Google Trip Plan, BC Adventure Smart, Trip Plan, Fermi Search and Rescue. You can type it all in, you can email it to somebody, uh, and email it to somebody who's responsible. You know, we have had situations where we've got looking for people and actually they're already at home, but the Trip Plan person didn't know that. You know, so make sure there's communication. Um, understanding realities of wilderness rescue. So it is not like calling for an ambulance when you twist your animal down in Rotary Park. It takes longer. So um, typically the call, very unlikely around here that you'll get cell coverage. And we'll talk about ways to get around that shortly. But let's just suppose you make a cell phone call. You, get, you actually do have cell phone. You call 911 and you say, I've broken my leg um, and I need help. And I'm in uh, Mongolia Bomb. So the person taking that message is sitting in Camden's. That's where the dispatchers are for this area. They don't know if Mongolia Bowl is a ski bowl, a restaurant, it could be a bar. They have absolutely no idea. So if you don't say it's a wilderness and I need search and, search and rescue, they're just going to say, okay, great. And they're going to start doing homework. They're going to send it to the nearest RCMP dispatcher in this area. RCMP dispatch, dispatcher hopefully knows uh, to call Fernie or Sparwood. Fernie, RCMP, look at it, and hopefully they immediately say, ah, Mongolia Bowl, yeah, that's not for us. We're going to call search and rescue. Except they can't call search and rescue. They have to call the Emergency Coordination Center in Victoria, which is a 24-hour emergency management unit for the whole of the province. They look at the map, and they say, that looks like Fernie search and rescue's catchment area, and then they call us. That whole process will typically take about 40 minutes, 45 minutes. And we are not sitting on a helipad waiting to go. We are volunteers, so we're doing stuff. So we then have to get those people together and then we go. So realistically, best circumstances will be there within the hour. That would be a great result. So keep that in mind. And um, keep that in mind when you're thinking of calling for help, call early. So if we know that this it's like the 40 minute and we have the search and rescue phone number, can we bypass all that? So that's a great question. So we don't advertise that as an option, Yeah. but uh, both Ryan and I testified to the fact that people that know us will call us directly. And is that kosher? Like, are you okay with that? We're okay with it, but our first question after we've said okay noted is, or first uh, request will be now call 911. Okay. We cannot go out without a task number. We can't requisition resources, we can't requisition helicopters, we don't have any coverage. But what we can do is get everything rolling. Right. And then normally what will happen is, and this happened many times, you know, we'll be chasing ECC saying we need that task number right now. So the answer is yes, it is a shortcut, but no, we're not handing out our personal sales to everybody. So if you happen to have them, sometimes it helps, but yeah. We should still call 911 first and then us. Gotcha. Because that process takes so long. Yeah. We can then talk to you and get something going in the background while we wait for everything to get authorized. Yeah. But calling us first will just slow it down yeah. because it okay. still has to go through that 911 process. Right. Yeah. Thanks, Ryan. Yeah, absolutely right. So, yeah, it, it helps compress it, but um, it's not an alternative. What it does mean, though, is call early. There's no problem with calling and then um, standing us down. We don't mind that. That happens all the time and we don't have a problem with it. Um, there's a huge inflection point, particularly in the winter. Four o'clock, I think I might be in trouble. I'll see if I can dig my sled out. I can't dig it out, it's five o'clock, I'll call for help. Well now it just went dark. Now there's a huge, huge difference in the service that we can provide. We can't fly, much harder for us to make avalanche hazard assessments. We're still coming, and we'll talk about some of the rescues, but it might be a 10 hour marathon which might be miserable, particularly for you, if you're injured. So, trip back. And the last thing is be the rescuer. We always say this, but you know, if you think about that rescue period, um, what we really want to do is we want to turn up, correct anything that's wrong with the person, you know, ADCs, broken stuff, bleeds and all that, package and go. That means that we're not going to spend that much time on the ground. But you, if you're the partner of that injured person, you're going to spend a lot of time with that person on the ground relative to us. So if you know how to light a fire, keep someone warm, provide first aid, make sure they're safe, call for help, make sure that the rescuers are going to be able to spot you, say, in a wooded area, 
Well, you are actually the rescuer that day. And if you fail in any of those things, well, then it's going to make our lives a lot harder and almost certainly the life of the person on the ground waiting for help a lot harder. So um, you are the rescuer as much as we are in that, so in that situation. Winter essentials. So we could talk forever about this. And you know, BC Sara does this little list of stuff, and I, I almost don't want to go through it because everyone has their favorite list. And anyone who says these are the 10 essentials is probably not taking into account 10 other essentials. But the real point of the matter is take stuff that allows you to stay somewhere you weren't expecting to stay. A flashlight's a good idea. Can you make fire? Can you provide first aid? Have you got extra food and water, extra clothing? Um, first aid, shelter, knife, you know, whatever it is. All of those things are going to make it a lot nicer to hang around waiting for help. Um, at the moment, it would make things nicer. When it's minus 20, it'd be the difference between, between life and death. There's no doubt about it. So take what you can. And of course, it depends on what you're doing out there. If you're a ski tourer, well, you don't want a pack that weighs 400 pounds with all the stuff that's going to keep you alive, because you actually aren't going to be able to get out the door. But if you're on a snowmobile and you have 400 horsepower dragging you around the mountain, then it makes a lot more sense to have even more gear. Um, so, you know, relative to what you're doing, take gear with you and anticipate the worst case. But you do end up having to spend the night there. In terms of safety, moving around in the winter, we expect everyone to be carrying the big three. Pro, shovel, transceiver. Uh, if you don't know what they are, I'm assuming everyone here does. But if you're out there, you should be carrying them, and you should know how to use them. And even more important, the person you're with should know how to use them. Because if you're buried under the snow, the fact that you're really good at it doesn't really help. And the fact that they've got an old transceiver they picked up in the Fernie last night that's got batteries at 5% isn't really going to help you. So it's super, super important that you trust your partner. And you know, we're not here to teach you how to do that. There are wonderful courses around town. Richard Duncan teaches some of them. Um, and. Um, that's where you should get that knowledge. But, you know, we do see it, but you can do with people coming from other countries who uh, maybe don't have the same sort of avalanche terrain that we do, who will go out for the day with one transceiver. Who's got the transceiver? And we've seen that before. And that's not a good idea, because if the transceiver is buried with the person who was carrying it, life just got a lot more complicated. Communication, so communication devices. So we all have our cell phones awesome, they do all sorts of things, we can even navigate with them and all that sort of thing. But they suck in rescues. We have very little cell service around here, and it's normally as soon as you pull them out, they die. Wet, cold, they absolutely hate that type of environment. Do not rely on these guys at all. Um, I'm sure you guys have all heard of personal locator beacons, in-reaches, spot devices. Um, these devices you can pick up for 100 bucks or so, you get a monthly plan, they go as low as, I want to say, $10 a month or something like that, and they are absolutely life-saving devices. You can poke it, there are all sorts of things you can do with them, but in the, in the simplest sense, you poke it, 911, a satellite signal will go from anywhere, it goes to a center in Texas, that center in Texas then starts to chain. Calls ECC, ECC call RCMP, RCMP calls SAR. They work all the time, generally speaking. If you're, you know, they'll tell you if you don't have a good signal, you'll move it around, all that sort of thing. Um, the newer versions allow you to communicate as well. So they'll either Bluetooth to your phone or have their own uh, keyboard. So you can say, not just that I need help, but I need help because I broke my leg or because my friend is having a heart attack or whatever it is that your emergency is. And the next level, which has just started, which we really like, and we had this last weekend, is that um, InReach or Spot will provide search and rescue with a specific number, and we can then start messaging directly to the device that's in the field. So we can say, Sar, in a way, in 20 minutes, can you tell us what's going on, or you know, whatever it is, or don't move the person, or, keep them warm, or whatever it is that you want to do. So these devices are absolutely amazing. If you poked it, stop moving. So it's really difficult for us to chase a moving one, because they, they tend to send signals every 10 minutes. It sort of depends what your what your plan is. But if every 10 minutes you're on a snowmobile and we're just getting you moving down a road, hard for us to keep up with you. Once you've pressed it, uh, stay with it. And if you're traveling in the backcountry and let's say you come across something going on, not your emergency, but they don't have the means to call for help and you poke it, stay with them. Because if you leave, we're going to chase you and we're going to not go to that person. We had that last winter. Someone went to uh, the Wrangler's cabin, I think, 
to ask, I don't know why they went to rainbow skating, and then poke this thing um, when someone was about six kilometers away upside down in a creek on a timber bike. And so, you know, we ended up going to the Wrangler's cabin before discovering that we needed to go somewhere else. So just kind of have that in mind. Um, can't recommend them enough. You know, in, in Fernie, I would say that this is absolutely the gold standard. If you're going into the backcountry and you don't have one of these, I would really ask you, what is your communications plan? What is your plan? The only thing you can have at that point is a trip plan, a piece of paper left with somebody else. That's not going to feel great, because you know what happens. It gets to five o'clock and they're like, ah, he probably got delayed, probably got a flat tire. So they wait till six, now it's 6.30, now they're like, this is weird. It's gonna, it's gonna roll away on you. This is the way to go, I can't insist on that enough. And particularly people, you know, that spend $15,000 on the snowmobile, $100, it's worth it. Everyone familiar with those? Anyone not familiar with those? Question, do you actually need a plan activated to be able to use the SOS function? Yes, you do, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so these are, these are commercial devices, so yeah, they want a plan. Now there are other beacons that you can get, um, which you can buy that don't need a plan, you can get them at NEC that go on a different frequency. Um, and those you don't need a plan, you just need to register online. Um, there are a few downsides of those ones. One is that they go to the, they go through JRCC, which is the Air Force. So that's reasonably fast, but there is no communications possible with it. So you can't send a message saying this is what's going on. Um, and a lot of people like these things because they provide other functions. So you can use it for texting people in the field. So you know, if you're late, coming back late, you can send a text via satellite to a cell phone. Uh, you can track your friends. So you can set it up so it's always sending a signal so they can see where you are. You know, there's quite a lot of commercial benefits of these. So I, I would tend to recommend these over those other ones. Uh, training. So it's kind of infinite. Um, in terms of accessing winter backcountry, the entry level uh, courses, Avalon Skills Training 1 and 2, you can get them through the college and all sorts of providers around Fernie. They're pretty awesome uh, courses. They give you um, uh, sort of overview of terrain assessment, snow structure assessment, safety assessments, and some rescue work. Um, and I feel like in many ways, uh, rather than making you into a really strong backcountry rescuer type, they tell you what you don't know. They make you realize just how varied and complex a snowpack can be and how moving around in that environment can be challenging. Um, and where to look for the right information. So, you know, you want to go and hike, you know, for instance, let's just say Fairy Creek Falls. Who's hiked to Fairy Creek Falls? I have, in the winter. Right. So it crosses one huge avalanche path. And we've seen that slide right in front of the falls there and bury the falls pretty much all the way up to the road on the other side. So I would say to you, if you want to go and hike Ferry Creek Falls, maybe just have a look at the Avalanche Canada website and make sure it isn't an extreme day. It doesn't happen very often, but if you happen to be there on the day it did, that would be a really bad day. So find out where we, want, where we get information. And you know, Avalanche Canada are a fantastic resource. So is the Ski Hill, there's an awesome uh, weather uh, bulletin they put out every day at the ski hill that is absolutely specific to our area. You, know, you can look at weatherchannel.com or whatever and it will give something from here to Cranbrook, which is not really mean for us. But the ski hill report is fabulous. It's like to this area. Temperatures, uh, snowfall, all of that stuff. Absolutely specific to Fernie. Highly recommend that. Another great resource are the patrollers on the hill. If you're thinking of doing some slack country, you want to hop into fish for some turns, stop at one of the huts and say, what do you think? What are you seeing out there? They're fantastic. They're out there all day, every day. They have a really good sense of what's going on out there. Keep in mind as well that you know that slack country uh, off the hill is, you know, it's a little bit like I said earlier, you can see the lights of town, but you're in a different world. That's exactly the same. If you decide to do some turns in Fishbowl or Mongolia Bowl, that has nothing to do with the ski hill. It's completely different. And even though you can see the ski hill, you're skiing terrain that is significantly uh, different not controlled. So just be aware of that. You know, you're into full backcountry mode, even though you're really close to town. Know your partners. I guess we talked about that earlier, but you know, bumping into guys at the bar, they've got some secret stash and you know, it sounds great and all. Um, they're the guys that'll be digging for you if you're buried. So you better know who they are. You better know that they've done their training and that they've got the right gear. Know your terrain, know your weather. We kind of talked about that avalanche hazard. Do your, do your homework. 
Um, I want to talk about calling for help a little bit more. So I think we talked, we talked about call early. We talked about using these devices. We talked about being the rescuer, what you do while you wait for rescue. Um, when, uh, when we respond, um, particularly if you respond by helicopter, you'll often see a helicopter come overhead and then disappear again. It doesn't mean that we're like, that looks horrible, we're not going to deal with that. It normally means that we're making an assessment. We might be doing either an avalanche hazard assessment. Um, if we're using our long line gear, then uh, we will always go take a look at what we're getting into before we put someone on the end of the line for obvious reasons, because it's high hazard. We don't want to discover that there's something there that was a bad idea to try and get into that. Um, never approach the helicopter. Let people in the helicopter come towards you. They often settle in the snow. The rotors are very low. They blow stuff everywhere. If you have loose gear, secure it. If you have an injured person lying face up, um, cover them. We don't want to be blowing snow and branches and other stuff in their faces. Um, yeah. Any questions? So let's talk about some recent rescues, because I feel like that always focuses our minds a little bit. And then we're like, hmm, what would I have done differently? Or could I have, could I have avoided that? So, uh, McAvoy Creek. So actually, this is the one I was referencing earlier. So, um, uh, someone poked their spot device, and it showed them at the Rangus cabin. It was after dark, so we responded by a snowmobile. Um, and when we got to the Rangus cabin, we discovered the person with the spot device, but it turned out that um, the person that they were calling about was a uh, timber sledder who had flipped his timber bike into a creek, McAvoy Creek. And the initial report was that he was, he was buried under his sled, they hadn't been able to move it, and he was pinned into water. And he was hypothermic and all the rest of it. So uh, we, we actually contacted the Fernie Snowmobile Association, who had a cat out in the area doing some grooming, and they groomed part of the road for us towards McAvoy Creek to make it easier uh, to get in by sled. <clears throat> it took a number of hours to get to him. Um, he was significantly injured, he had a spinal injury, which meant that we had to build a sled road in um, to make it flat enough. We can't really bring someone with a spinal injury out like bouncing and bumping over whoop de doos behind a snowmobile. You know, O2, drugs, sp spinal immobilization, all that sort of thing. Um, and we dragged him back out. We got into the Wrangler's cabin and he was really keen to keep going. So uh, we brought him back out to Fernie and Wood, is there? And then, uh, and then handed him over to ambulance. I want to say that that started at about 8 in the evening and it finished at about 4 in the morning. So it's a pretty major exercise and of course this guy, you know, in significant pain, we can provide drugs and stuff like that, but even so, it's a pretty horrible evening out there. So um, any lessons from that? Spot, awesome, because he wouldn't have called for help otherwise. Someone with a spot moving around, not quite so awesome. Um, the injury, so 4 in the afternoon, um, that's a brave time to be pulling crazy stuff in creeks on timber sleds. And we, you know, our message is always get smarter as the day goes on. Do the really dumb stuff in the morning. And then when you want to try your backflip on your sled or whatever, come really close to town. <laughs> <laughs> and then it'll be a lot easier. Um, so yeah, you know, you know, thinking about it, you should probably have taking it easy. That's on scene now, uh, packaging him. So, you know, you can see that toboggan there. It's like a fiberglass toboggan. He's in a vat mat, which is an inflatable. Uh, actually, you know, comes out of it. Or whatever the opposite of inflatable is. Deflatable. Um, secured in a tarp. And then he's dragged in that for four hours. Sucks. What does the snowmobile road look like? What do you mean when you created a snowmobile road? Just to get the sleds in there, because it was like all whoop de doos down to a creek. Yeah, just drove back and forth. Back and forth. Just, and shovel, and just pack it down. And oh, just yeah. so it wasn't cycling. Yeah. Because okay. the last thing we want to do is roll the sled with that yeah. and attach the back. Yeah. So like I'm a just going to make the process of creating it. Yeah, we had about a few kilometers to get from the edge to the next road, which was ungroomed, and then 10 kilometers on an ungroomed road, and then we hit the cat trap. So we about 40 in total. Being total yeah. Yeah. Um, um, and so, you know, just some thoughts about it. Uh, you know, so we had four people out there that night, I think, and then the management here, you know. So, you know, four members of search and rescue are completely taken out for the next day, right? 
um, our equipment is thrashed to pieces. Fernie Snowwood Association have diverted their groomer from the work it's meant to be doing for Sunday morning for all those hundreds of people who are going to be driving their snowmobiles up there to try and build a random road out towards McAvoy Creek. So I guess the point of that is really just to say consequences. You know, this is a horrible event for this person, and of course they didn't want it to happen, but it has a lot of ripple effect throughout the community. The next day, all of the snowmobile community are, are now snowmobiling on roads which are not completed, maybe increasing the hazard to them. The coverage for search and rescue is lower than it was to get people recovering. So, you know, this has an impact on the whole community. Martin Ridge. This was, another, this was a slightly weird one. Um, we had a big call out the day before this, and we had some people um, who were on scene uh, that we were calling to get an update on the subject. And it was that they were actually in cell service. And so the next day when we, would, we were doing a debrief on that rescue, my cell phone went, and it was somebody who had been on scene, one of the people there, and they said that they were up on Martin Ridge, um, so it was a day snowing heavily, the ceiling was incredibly low, and the avalanche hazard was very high. And they said they were lost. Couldn't work out how to get down from Martin Ridge, which is you know, that one kind of above concrete there. So um, kind of puts us in a slightly awkward position because they weren't calling for help. They were just saying they were lost. Could we help them? So we pinged their phone, and we set them their location on a map, and we said, if you get from A to B, then you'll get down the concrete road. But of course, it puts us in an awkward position because we knew as soon as they started trying to go down, they'd go out of cell range. We haven't been called out, but now we have a bit of a responsibility for those people. Because if we just all go home and you know go to bed, and then it turns out that they died overnight, someone's going to say, "Well, they called search and rescue, and those guys didn't do anything." So we decided that by six o'clock that evening, we would call nine one one if we hadn't heard from them. About five thirty, they called nine one one. They were completely stuck. They were lost. They didn't have a clue where to go. Um, and so, of course, by then it was dark, so back on the snowmobiles, and that was a really, really hard night for us to make some decisions, because the avalanche hazard was brutal, it was snowing extremely heavily, and um, a lot of Cold Creek Road crosses various avalanche paths, so we had to take some really difficult decisions um, to get to them, and eventually, you know, we got to the point where we were probably five minutes from saying, we're out. At the end of the day, there's no point in us getting buried in the avalanche. It's going to help those people, and it's definitely not good for us um, when we got to them. So um, it was, yeah, it was quite, a, quite epic. Uh, that's that night, I think. See, it's snowing heavily. Um, and on that, you know, what are our takeaways on that? The first is, like Ryan said, if it's an emergency, call 911 and then call personal contacts and search and rescue. Uh, secondly, don't rely on your cell phone. Um, third, you don't go out when the conditions are horrible and you're not, you don't have the skills to, to be out there. Um, on the flip side of things, what did they do right? They did stop when they got into trouble. They didn't keep going because we were pretty confident they would have got buried had they done so. Um, but again, another all-night marathon to get them out. This one, um, so an extremely serious incident. Um, but happened at a much more benign time of day. So this was around midday, I want to say, and just out, just beyond, beyond the Cold Creek staging area. Um, I'm sure anyone who lives in town will remember those floods two November ago, I guess it was, that washed out Cold Creek and various other creeks around town. Um, <clears throat> one of the bridges that got washed out was just beyond the gun range there, and there's just a bridge standing in the middle of the plain now. It doesn't attach either side to any road. Um, and so the snowmobile access now goes, takes a sharp left in front of that and goes round it. But these two guys were on rental sleds and uh, possibly not paying enough attention, but you know, saw road, bridge, and figured that that was the line to take. So they shot off um, a drop into Coal Creek, where Coal Creek is frozen solid. So like a 12 foot drop into the creek. The first guy went over and, you know, he knocked a few teeth out, broke his jaw, no, not especially serious. But the second guy, um, once he lost sight of him, assumed that he had just fallen behind, so he accelerated hard. And he went over it at about 70 or 80 kilometers an hour. Luckily for the guy who was down there, he did clear him. But he went maybe 100 feet, you know, 50 foot jump, 
and then hit the bank on the opposite side and then got thrown another 50 feet. And his injuries were incredibly serious. Um, he broke uh, both legs, he broke a femur, he broke seven ribs, uh, punctured lung, all his thoracic and lumbar vertebrae were either shattered or burst fractured or compressed, uh, skull fracture, about as bad as it gets when still being, still breathing. Um, so, luck, so what we did when we realized how serious it was, we sent two sleds down there immediately to stabilize him. He was sitting on breakable ice, lying on breakable ice, which is power. Two guys on snowmobiles down there just to stabilize him. We we're fortunate to have a nurse who happened to be going by, who's also there on scene, just to stabilize him, stop anyone moving him. And we actually used, we used the long line just to move him, that's on that day, to move him from there, literally to the back of the ambulance and put him directly on the gurney. Uh, and I really have to say, you know, he did been in contact with us a bunch of times since, and you know, he's he's fixed up. I guess they replaced his spine with a piece of rebar or something like that, but you know, he can't do yoga anymore, but he, he can still walk around and stuff. So, you know, that's one of those days I would say that long line was just completely changed the outcome. If we had to pull him out with a snowmobile, you know, it would have been such a good day. This was just a few weeks ago, uh, so a burial. So, you know, um, you would think that in Fernie that we respond to an awful lot of avalanches uh, and involvements, and the answer is we don't, actually. We respond to an awful lot more trauma, uh, as in, you know, snowmobiles driving into trees, into each other, awful stuff, skiers getting hurt. But we do have, as you can imagine, from time to time avalanches. These are three skiers up in Orca Bowl, which is near Island Lake, kind of between Island Lake and the ski hill. They were staying at the Thunder Meadows cabin. And they were actually very experienced. They were ski patrollers, not from this town, but from Red Mountain. And they'd been skiing for a few days. And actually, this came in um, thanks to you know, the expertise of people that work in the valley. Uh, one of the guys, the two guys at um, Island Lake Lodge, one was out skiing that day, and she noticed on the second tour that she did that there was a huge fracture line that she had not seen the time before. And she could see three tracks going into it. She called the lodge, and one of the guides there called me. And so we were already actively looking into it, working on what resources we had when actually these guys poked their spot device. And it turned out that the third skier into the bowl had triggered the avalanche. Two people were standing below him on a little bit of an island, and he got swept right by them. And he got buried in a terrain trap, so you know, a little bit of a, a gully. Um, and it was just incredibly fortunate that he didn't die. The amount of snow involved, um, the guys there immediately turned on their transceivers to search for him, and the first uh, beep they got was 65 meters, which is pretty much at the extreme of any transceiver search, and over a mound. And they went over the mound, and they just saw a glove sticking out. And they went straight to the glove, and they started digging. And he had uh, you know, an ice plug in his throat, so the snow that had got jammed down his throat had melted to kind of occlude his airway. Um, and had they not seen the glove, you know, if they'd had to do a little bit of a search and then a probe and then a shovel, pretty sure he would not have made it. Uh, so by the time we got there, they had dug him out. Um, he did have a few broken bones and stuff like that. Quite frankly, in the great scheme of things, you know, that's, I forget what, we're pretty happy with that outcome. Anything else on that right? Yeah, I know they were a little prepared, but he went probably 200 plus meters. Bad, ankle, so. bad day yeah. out. Yeah. But they had everything secured, and their gear was in the trees, and they had a spot to land, and all the people were away, and so it made it pretty simple. Um, but yeah, you know, they were super experienced. And I'd say, out of all the avalanche courses that I've done, the one thing that was my favorite quote is just remember the snow doesn't know you're an expert. And, you know, as good as you are, um, every now and then something, go, something can go wrong. And these guys, as like Ryan said, they, they did everything right, uh, other than that one thing, which is to ski that slope that day. Um, and then I was just going to briefly talk, and time to add it here, we had one just a couple of days ago uh, that was kind of interesting. Uh, so uh, we got a call for a snowmobiler having a heart attack up at the Rolling Hills cabin. So, um, you know, a group was out for the day. And we have, we have quite a lot of cardiac uh, responses to snowmobilers. You know, big machines, and that day, heavy wet snow, getting stuck, digging them out, getting dehydrated, sometimes alcohol's involved. 
Um, and it just puts an awful lot of strain on the body. So he's only 42 years old, but he had a serious MI while he was out there. Um, fortunately, he was right next to the Rolling Hills cabin when it happened, so they went into the cabin. Um, and we responded quickly. As soon as we did an assessment, we you know, we recognized it was a cardiac emergency, oxygen, brought him out. He came back here, stars to Calgary. I think he went unresponsive in the start on the stars helicopter. They resuscitated him, and it turned out he had you know, an 80% occlusion of his aorta. It's a stent. He's still around to tell the tale. Um, and so I said, those are, you know, though we do get heart attacks, you know, the vast majority of what we deal with are trauma. Generally speaking, it's people hurting themselves rather than having medical issues. Um, but yeah, this kind of gives you a little bit of a range of, of what's going on there. Like the rescue was with the helicopter? Or was yeah, we flew to Rolling Hills, yeah. yeah. And again, you know, particularly for cardiac issues, any movement is, you know, we try not to lose it as much as possible. So, yeah. um, that was actually the, that's back to that Orca Bowl. That's the ride that guy went, they came in up here, I think that's all the rock there. And then he came all the way down here and he got buried right at the bottom. Pretty scary day out. Um, yeah. So hopefully that gives you, you know, a bit of an idea of what we're dealing with in the winter. Um, yeah, so, you know, I kind of opened it up to questions. If people have any ideas or thoughts, other things that you'd like us to talk about, that's kind of the formal bit of what we were going to talk about. Yeah. There's a risk inside of Fernie um, Ski Resort, like in inbounds, like, you know, you're inbounds, a big power day, they open a note on it, but is there still a risk of, um, like obviously there would be, uh, what, what is that risk? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so, as you know, the ski hill modifies its, smoke, ski, its snowpack, it does all that avalanche control work. Um, they have a, you know, a whole model of what tolerance they have, and I think, I believe they have a really low percentage tolerance for a size two, size ones are okay. Um, and so they work really hard to achieve that, but, again, the snow doesn't know that you're an expert. So does it ever go wrong on them? The answer is yes, very, very occasionally. Yeah. Very, very occasionally. So in the 20 years that I've been doing it, um, the only reason that we would ever get called to the ski hill is if there was a situation like the one you just described and they needed extra bodies, and that's only happened once in 20 years. And there was nobody involved. So I'd say they do an amazing job up there. I'd say the problem is incredibly low. Now, if you have a transceiver, should you not bother wearing it at the ski hill? Wear it. Spend $400 on the thing, you might as well have it. Because the first thing that's going to happen if patrol come on scene to an inbound avalanche is they're going to switch to receive. Because that's the most likely way they're going to get someone alive. And then they'll bring dogs and wreck and blah, blah, blah. So I'd highly recommend it. No reason not to. But the chances of you needing it are very, very, very good. Yeah. That's a good question. What is the RECO like, sort of process like? Is it similar to Beacon? Uh, yeah, no, not, not really. Um, so the RECO is just like a reflector thing that's in your jacket yeah. or whatever. And you see that you know, various brands carry them. Um, the, the big difference with RECO is that the only people that carry the receivers are organized areas. Mm -hmm. So the ski hill has it, we have it, but your buddy won't have it. So if you're out skiing in the backcountry, you won't be skiing with a reco receiver. But if you guys have it, like, what's the process for you guys <coughs> to find someone with a reco? Like, is it harder? Is it easier? Or is it uh, no, it's less. It, it's less easy. It's more cumbersome. Okay. It's slower, mm -hmm. and it's the second thing we're probably going to go to. The new one actually has a 450 sensor. It receives a transceiver signal as well as a reco signal, okay. but it's a slower process. And I, and I hate to say it, but I feel like for winter purposes, it's more of a body recovery tool than it is for a live find. And quite frankly, if we're doing any of the searching, whether it's a transceiver search, a dog search, or a reco search, it's probably body recovery. That little timeline that I described of how long it takes us to get on scene, I'm sure anyone who's done an avalanche course will you know, 15 minutes under the snow, 90% chance of survival, halving every 15 minutes. Well, there's a lot of those 15 minute portions before we get there. And that assumes you didn't get slammed into a rock at 200 kilometers an hour as well. So yeah, RECO is, um, RECO is a great tool, don't get me wrong, but it's not, it's more of an organized rescue tool and a good backup. Now RECO is working, and we don't have it yet here in Fernie, but um, 
they're doing this uh, much more sensitive receiver that you can um, fly beneath a helicopter that works for summer rescues. And the idea is, you know, you just fly over the forest and you find a missing kid. Um, and it's pretty good. It's not amazing, but it's pretty good. More like a radar, like it's just like your chips aren't transmitting anything. <coughs> so it has to be pointed directly at you and it's obscured by water and trees and so the depth and the, the, how dense the snow is, all that stuff plays into how easy it is and how effective it is. And the water's a good point, so you know if you have your record reflector here and you end up down here in snow, you probably won't pick it up. That's why your jack will have one in the hood and one in the leg and they're on different sides of your own. Make sense? Yeah, the straight shot of the rectal, what do you feel the distance compared to the range? Yeah. Ooh. It's 100 meters for sure. In theory, yeah. But it, it's yeah. just open air across the room. Yeah. But they're, they're quite quirky to work with. Uh, you know, modern transceivers, as you know, you know they, they take you in a direction and they tell you how far and all the rest of it. And the record is more like a, you know, like a sonar or submarine. Really. <laughs> And it needs good interpretation and stuff like that. It's uh, yeah, it's useful. Don't get me wrong. If it's in your jacket, it's a great thing. But I wouldn't be buying a jacket for that and saying I don't need a transceiver. Yeah. How many rescues did you guys do last year? About forty-five. Okay. And what percentage of people went to work Uh, it's about half and half, I would say. It, you know, in um, in BC. Um, you know, the most active SAR group is probably North Shore Rescue. You know, they have a big urban town and a whole bunch of mountains. And they, uh, they do about 120 rescues a year, I want to say. Squamish is about the same. Uh, Whistler would be about 60. Um, and then in the valley, you know, Elford and Spa would probably do between 5 and 10 each, something like that a year, maybe a bit less. Kimberley does, I think, an eight last year. Fernie's definitely a hot spot. Um, and definitely, you know, compared to even the bigger groups out west, we get, we get a lot. Uh, the big difference that we have here, uh, compared to some of the ones out west, is um, out west a lot, of the, a lot of it is searching. So, you know, despondent adults, um, elderly people, missing kids, big searches that last for days on end. Whereas in Fernie, I want to say 99.9% .9 of what we do is uh, rescues for significant trauma. And occasionally medical issues. The other thing I'd say in Bernie is that people are tough as nails. So, you know, I hear from the ER doctors all the time of these wrecked mountain bikers, um, and they normally just drag their carcasses into the ER. You know, <laughs> crawl in. So, yeah, we, we only deal with the really serious stuff, you know, broken pelvises, spinal stuff, head injuries, but, you know, broken wrists, collarbones, blah. go to the ER, carry on straight to the Fernie afterwards. <laughs> And like obviously gear isn't like rescuing someone's sled. I'm sure it's not at the top of your furry list, but how does that like their skiers like you get your speed out for them, like mountain bikers? Yeah, that's a great that's a great question. The answer is yeah, equipment is at the very bottom of the list. Mm -hmm. But we also recognize that people, you know, are as attached to their equipment as we are, mm -hmm. uh, to ours. <laughs> so, you know, if we can take skis out, we will. Snowmobiles are different. Generally speaking, we won't. Like, if we can drive them out for the people, then we will. We won't sling them out under the helicopter. We'll just give uh, the people the, you know, Greg's number to send and let them sort it out with him. We had one last winter. Um, remember that guy who was on like a high mountain on, some, on a slope, but it turned out to be like almost sheer ice. It's like a 40 degree slope. And he got up the top and then, you know, his sled started tumbling and it ended up on this tiny little island of rocks um, with him. Um, and it was just suspended above a cliff. And so we long lined him out and, uh, you know, he said, you know, can you pull my sled out? And we were like, no. Um, we weren't really sure how we were going to get out there, but the sled does have what, like a grappling hook. So they went back and just tried to kind of hook it with the, you know, try and hook the handlebars. I don't know if it worked out. Greg was pretty sure he's going to knock it off the cliff. Yeah. Do you know how much that costs? Like, if you have to call for just by name Greg? Yeah, probably like, four or five hundred dollars. Oh, that's would not, be bad. not as bad as it could be. Yeah. It's per hour, so it depends on how far you are and how yeah. long it takes to get it hooked up. That's the average cost, is like four to Yeah. But if it's, you know, for instance, if it's somewhere like I just described, but people need to go on the ground to do that, then it gets a lot more expensive because either we have to go in 
or an avalanche safety officer has to go in and declare it safe to put people on the ground and stuff like that. Then it gets much more complicated. Um, but yeah, you know, we kind of get it. We people are you know attached to their gear. Uh, bikes are the same. You know, last uh, last spring, this race called the Tour Divide was coming through Fernie, and they decided, you know, they just kind of got that bike. <coughs> the weather was terrible, and they were all racing, and you know, they're all in lycra and all that, and, you know, trying to ride through the blizzards and all freezing their butts off and getting in trouble. I think they had to rescue 18 of them or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, same deal, those guys, you know, they, their bikes cost $25,000, you know, like they're the best bikes on the planet. And so I, I want to say that we did bring every bike out eventually. Um, so yeah, we will if we can. The other thing is pets. You know, um, we've had people call us from the top of Mount Fernie and say, you know, my dog doesn't want to move another inch. Uh, and it's like, uh. so depending on what's happening, we will either give him the number of Greg, because then, you know, he can just put it in a cargo, you know, he can hover a cargo net, throw the dog in there, fly it out. He won't like it, but at least it'll get down. Um, the only time that we will respond to that is if we think that the, the people who are with it are at risk because they're going to do something to save the dog that's going to put them at risk. So you know, say dog on ice. That's, a, that's absolutely typical out east rescue scenario. Dog runs onto the ice, gets into trouble, owner runs on, breaks through, dog runs off, and the owner drowns. Uh, so you know, any of that sort of stuff, we try and, you know, try and anticipate if people are going to take decisions that will put them in harm's way, and then we'll help. And what about the cost for like, your guys' services? Like, does anyone say you're coming from the state or something, or another country, or even like, different provinces? Or no, so that's a great question, and the answer is nobody pays. Okay. So it doesn't matter if you're from the States or from Ontario or from Fernie, um, you're not going to pay for the rescue. And there's been a lot of debate about this, um, and the reason that we all support no charge for rescue is pretty simple. Um, <clears throat> in places that they do do that, for instance in the United States, certain states in the United States, uh, it generally means people delay calling for rescues, which puts us at risk. Now it's dark, now the person's about to die, etc. So that's not good for, that, for us or for them. Uh, the second reason is, um, they hardly ever pay. You get a $58,000 bill for a rescue in Montana, how are they going to make you pay? So it's a bit of a waste of time. Um, and the decision taken in BC is that um, you know, we care enough about people. Uh, it's also a super important part of our tourist uh, push, I suppose. You know, we don't want to advertise to the whole world, come to BC, it's amazing, enjoy the wilderness. Oh, you have a broken ankle, or you're going to die. Um, you know, it's quite a cheap, I want to say the cost every year to the province of search and rescue service is about $25 million, which is a kind of a drop in the ocean compared to lots of other things. So I, I personally think it's a great service. That can get a little bit controversial. You know, if you go to the ski hill and you rupture your ACL on Red Tree, well, then you're going to get brought down by the patrol, you're going to put in an ambulance, you're going to get a bill for $180 for the ambulance. But if you do it in a fishbowl 15 meters away, well, you'll get a $3,000 an hour ambulance straight to the hospital. So I don't know if there's a lesson there, maybe just kind of crawl out of bounds. <laughs> there are anomalies, but, but yeah, you know, overall, you know, it, it does make sense. We, we prefer that model.